Good morning. Really cool to have you here. Happy Monday. Hope you had a good weekend. Stuff like that. Um, this week, what we're going to do, uh, the lab we did on Friday, the acid-based titrations lab, we'll turn that in on Friday. I don't think it'll be too crazy. Let me know if you have any questions. Problem set number five is up. And this week, uh, we're going to only do problem set five in recitation. Uh, I want to give you a little bit more time to think about the quiz this week. So quiz five is going to be a take-home quiz. So you won't take a quiz in class this week. Um, how this quiz will work is uh, Monday, a week from today, which yes, it's Memorial Day and I'm sorry about that, but Monday I will release it online, all right? Uh, print it, all right? I want a printed copy turned in and it will be due Wednesday. And for those of you in this class, it'll all be 9 a.m. in this classroom, all right? So you have to come to class on Wednesday or talk to me if you can, something like that. So you have from Monday until Wednesday to work on it. It'll have some questions from problem set five. I will return problem set five to you uh, once you're once, uh, in lab probably this week, which is cool. And then finally, we'll do the lab with probably the longest name of all the labs in all of the Chem 220 series. It's determination of KSP, delta G, delta H, and delta S for calcium hydroxide. And it's kind of a cool lab how it incorporates all these little pieces into one part. Um, it is a type of titration lab, but it's not a traditional titration. We won't be after KAs and stuff like that, although I will talk about how you can find KSP. So, uh, problem set five, Friday, uh, turn in the acid base lab from last Friday on Friday, uh, bring a printed copy, determination, KSP, et cetera, et cetera, calcium hydroxide, and quiz five, take home quiz this week, it'll be due, it'll, well, you'll be at, you'll get access to it next week, Monday morning, and then it will be due Wednesday, 531st, uh, for everybody in here except Kaylin at 9 a.m. So you'll have to come to lecture next Wednesday. If you absolutely can't, talk to me. We'll arrange something. Questions? Yeah. So do we have recitation on credit? Yes, definitely. We will go over problem set five. And I just want to make sure we have enough time to answer all questions and stuff like that for that. So cool. Questions? All right. On Friday, last week Friday, we ended up, uh, we were talking about balancing redox reactions and base. And we went through some examples. Uh, there were redox reactions in acid. At the end of the day, you can have H plus and water, all right? In a base, at the end, you can only have hydroxide and water. And like I told you quickly, and I'll go through it again, for whatever reason, in my mind, I have problems balancing things in base, all right? Like, here's the punchline. You're supposed to add water to the side that's missing hydrogens, and you're supposed to add hydroxide to the side that's missing oxygens. But for whatever reason, that doesn't work very well for me. So I wanna show you what I consider to be the classic way to solve this problem, using just hydroxide and water, and then I'll show you what I informally called Michael's method. It is longer, it works 100% of the time, and for me, it works a lot better. So pick the way that works for you, okay? Um, we're looking at a reaction where permanganate is reacting with a type of peroxide, which is what this crazy thing is. It makes what's called manganate, which is a weird form of manganese, and oxygen. And we're trying to balance it in a redox reaction. Now in a redox reaction, you have balancing of the atoms, all right? And if you look at this, like there's a manganese here and a manganese there, so that's cool. There's four plus two, six oxygens. And on the product side, you have four plus two, six oxygens as well. So that's cool, but the one hydrogen right there, there's no hydrogen present on the product side. So even with our Chem 221 thought process on, you can see it's not balanced or anything like that. But the other thing we have to do is we have to make sure that these reactions are balanced for charge. And it's critical that you start and continue to keep writing charges, all right? So it's zinc versus zinc plus two, there's a big difference, all right? Uh, plus two dissolves in water. The zinc is a mineral you can eat to fight colds and stuff, but it's certainly a lot different than zinc plus two. So um, on Friday, I introduced these steps, and if you go through them, especially at first, 
these problems will fall for you. They're a little tedious sometimes. You can skip them sometimes a little bit. Um, I want to go through the steps here real fast for this one. This first step is just to write the reactions that look somewhat similar together. Now, if you know which one is oxidized and reduced, awesome, but you don't have to, all right? So for example, permanganate and manganate certainly look similar. We should put those together, all right? And the oxygen containing species should certainly go well together. You don't have to know, as I said, if they're oxidized or reduced, that'll pop out here a little bit at the end. The next part is where you have to be very attentive to the pH of the solution. If you have a pH less than seven, an acidic solution, then you add H plus and water. And that, as we'll talk about a little bit, is uh, really good in my brain. But in base, at the very end, you can only have hydroxide and water. So pH is greater than seven, you would only have uh, basic solutions around. And so the first reaction, when we balance it for mass, is balanced, all right? A manganese on the left and the right, four oxygens on the left and the right, so that part is cool. But when you look at just the black parts at first, as we talked about, two oxygens, two oxygens are cool, but that one hydrogen is not cool. So if you're gonna do it the more efficient way, and honestly, I would wish that you could do it this way. If it doesn't, I've got another way to help you out. You add water to the hydrogen deficient side. So in this case, hydrogen, there's one black hydrogen, but there's no black hydrogens on the right. So that's why we ended up adding a water. But adding water makes you have to add a hydroxide to the other side as well, because water, of course, has an extra O and an H, so we'll add an OH minus to the left side. Now at this point, if you start feeling weird, you can always step back and make sure it is balanced for mass. So mass is again, just number of atoms. Two oxygens plus one, three oxygens reactant side, two oxygens plus one, three oxygens on product side. And one plus one, two hydrogens are balanced by two hydrogens. Works really well. So sometimes adding just hydroxide and water is beautiful. It makes, it makes sense, it's really easy. But if you start getting confused, I'll show you another method which I find works really, really well. Um, any questions so far? Okay, after we balanced for mass, the next thing we looked at was the charge. And remember, at this phase, you can only add negative electrons. So you add the negative electrons to the more positive side. So in the first case, hydroxide and the peroxide each have a minus one. And if you look at just the black parts, neither one of those have a charge. So looking at just the black compounds, there's negative two there and there's zero charge right there. And a good reaction will be balanced for both mass and charge. So we're gonna balance the charge by adding two negative electrons. Again, you can only add negative electrons. I'm gonna keep saying that, and I'm sorry it's repetitive, but you can't add positive protons. You can't subtract two electrons. These are some things I've seen before. You can only add negative electrons. But if you do that, then voila, two neg negative two on the left, negative two on the right, good to go. The other one isn't as bad. Uh, permanganate has a minus one and manganate has a minus two. So again, this one's more negative and this one is more positive than the manganate. So we'll add one electron there to make that one kind of fall in. Any questions on any of this? Cool. Now, the next part is that at the end, we're gonna combine the half reactions together. And by the way, if electrons are showing, they're called half reactions. We're gonna combine the half reactions together so that all of the electrons disappear. You don't wanna show electrons when you combine them. So you can see that right now, this one has two electrons, but this one has only one. So we're gonna, mul no, blah, we're gonna multiply that second reaction by two. And if you do that, you get two electrons plus two permanganates making two manganates. Uh, you have to do the whole reaction by two. You can't do just one. That's really cool because then the electrons that are here on the reactant side will be canceled by the electrons here on the product side. 
By the way, I forgot to mention, I said earlier you don't have to worry about which one's being oxidized and reduced. When you balance the charge, you should have electrons as products on one of them, and you should have electron or electrons as reactants on the other. So this one is gaining electrons, it's being reduced. On the other hand, this reaction is losing electrons, it's being oxidized. If you saw both electrons on the reactant side or both on the product side, relook at your charges just to make sure everything is good to go. Okay, so the last step then, once you've got the electrons that are equal to each other, you literally just add them together. So hydroxide plus the, uh, plus the uh, peroxide plus the two permanganates makes oxygen, water, and two manganates. Uh, like we talked about on Friday, you're feeling uncertain about it, man, check it out. You can look for both mass and charge being balanced in your final reaction if you've done it right. So an example of that, one oxygen, two oxygen, two times four, eight. So eight, 10, 11 oxygens. So on the product side, we should have that too. Two times four, eight, nine, 10, 11, bam. Um, you can do the same for oxygen, manganese, et cetera, et cetera. Um, charges, minus one, minus one, two times minus one, so there's an overall minus four on the reactant side. And if you look at the product side, two times minus two, minus four. So you can always double check yourself, make sure you're good to go. All right, questions? Okay. So like I said quickly on Friday, and I want to spend a little bit more time, is that for some reason, this hydroxide water thing always trips me up. I, I know intellectually you're supposed to add water to the hydrogen deficient side and hydroxide to the oxygen deficient side, but sometimes it just doesn't gel for me and I don't know what it is. So I'm going to show you the alternative method call it Michael's method or you can just call it whatever. I honestly hope you can do it the first way. <laughs> and sometimes even I with my, you know, condition, <laughs> uh, even I sometimes can do the first way. But if you have to, this is a cool way to do it. Now, my way is longer, but it does work 100% of the time. And what I do is I first balance the reactions in acid, and then at the very end, I neutralize the acid with hydroxide because hydroxide plus acid equals water, all right? It's very product favored, so we can do that. And of course, if you add hydroxide to the reactant side, you add it to the product side. So very quickly, what you wanna do, just like before, write the half reactions, i.e. make the pieces that look similar, put them together. So the two manganese go together, the two oxygens go together. This part's the different part. At this part now, I'm gonna pretend that we're doing it in acid. And in acid, you would add H plus and water. So for the first one, that's pretty chill because, well, I wrote the reduction part first, but uh, up here, that's pretty easy because we're just missing an H plus or an H, all right? So we'll add an H plus right there. Sweet. So this is a half reaction if we were an acid. And again, we're not an acid, but we're pretending it's an acid, okay? Cool. Uh, you could add H plus and water if you're balancing an acid. At the end, for bases, of course, you have to have hydroxide and water. Okay, the next parts are pretty similar. You wanna add those negative electrons. That's the only thing you can add. So negative two electrons there. You'll add one electron to the manganese, just like before. That part hasn't changed. Also, just like before, we've got to make sure our electrons cancel each other out. We'll multiply the second reaction through by two in order to make sure the electrons are the same. So then, just like before, we'll combine those two half reactions together and you end up with this. So the peroxide plus the two permanganates makes oxygen plus H plus plus two manganates. And if this reaction was an acid, this is what we, we'd leave it at, all right? Cool, however, darn it, we're in base, all right? Now, pH is less than seven, again, are the acidic ones, and greater than seven are the bases. So what we're gonna do here in a little bit is we're gonna get rid of this H+, plus, and we get rid of it by adding a hydroxide. H plus plus hydroxide makes water to the tune of a K of 10 to the 14th. Very, very product favor. 
But if, <clears throat> excuse me, if I add um, a hydroxide to neutralize the H+, plus, I have to add a hydroxide to this side as well. So you have to do it both ways. So when you're doing this step, all right, you want to add an OH- minus for every H+, plus you have. So in this case, we add one H+, plus, we'll add one hydroxide, and the stuff in the blue box there is going to turn into water on the next slide. However, just like in math, if you add something to one side, you have to add it to the other side. So we're also going to add a hydroxide to the reactant side to make that all play out. So these two together make water, all right? We end up with a hydroxide, and lo and behold, all of our acid is gone. So this is the answer we had earlier. It's the same reaction, balance now in base instead of acid. Um, and it works really well. So again, once in a while in my world, I've come across these reactions and I just can't seem to see hydroxide in water. I don't know what it is, you know, I need to go to a special school, I don't know, whatever. But this way is an awesome way to get around it. It is longer, all right, but always think about it in the back of your mind because it works really well. I use this probably, as much as I've done these, I still probably use this method like 60% of the time. So for me, it's been super cool. But again, if you don't have to use it, and you can use hydroxide and water. Cool. Any questions on that? Okay. So just some balancing uh, tips before we leave and stuff. Um, the pH is critical, all right? pH less than seven, you're an acid. So at the end, you'll have H plus and water. But if the pH is greater than seven, then you're basic, you'll have hydroxide and water. So make sure you've got the right pH. You don't end up with the wrong parts. Um, I've seen this a lot when I teach this stuff. You can only add negative electrons. You can only add H plus and water if it's an acid or hydroxide and water if it's base. So don't add oxygen, oxygen atoms, oxide, hydrogen gas, hydrogen atoms. These are things I've seen, all right? You, can, you have to follow these rules pretty specifically. Um, the charges are critical, all right, make sure you balance. And by all means, yeah, any of these steps, all right, you can always check yourself. So I do this a lot myself with the final equation. I'll make sure that it's balanced for mass, the number of atoms, the same on both sides, the charges are the same on both sides. Um, this handout goes into more detail about how to do this. It's in the companion, it's also online. I can help you find it if you get stuck. Questions? So, balancing redox reactions is really cool, all right? Uh, a lot of neat things. So we saw on Friday that one of the uses for redox reactions is direct redox chemistry. So, for example, in this example, you're taking a piece of zinc metal and placing it right in copper 2 plus ions. And this is an example of a direct redox reaction. The zinc is losing electrons to become zinc 2 plus, the copper is, copper two plus is gaining electrons to become copper metal. So after a while, you begin to see copper metal form. Uh, the empirical formula lab in Chem 221, if you were with me in Chem 221, this is exactly what we did. We put a piece of zinc metal in the blue copper, the blue went away, you ended up with kind of this reddish looking copper stuff. Um, there was zinc left over, so we talked about limiting reactants, blah, blah, blah. Um, Direct redox reactions, almost 100% yield, very, very efficient. So if you have to make something, it's a really cool way to do it, all right? Um, here's the half reactions, zinc going to zinc two plus, copper two plus going to copper metal. Um, remember that something that's oxidized is also called the reducing agent. Something that's reduced is also known as the oxidizing agent. So again, this is really cool for making certain types of chemicals put the chemicals that are being oxidized and reduced together, uh, the magic happens, <laughs> and it's very efficient, all right? When you make most compounds, like if we wanted to make caffeine in the lab, uh, we would not get the percent yields that we would have probably with a direct yield like this. this. These are really efficient. But the real reason why we're studying electrochemistry from a chemical perspective is not really about making these kind of compounds. We'll talk about that in a little bit. This is just a reminder question. It says, which one is the reducing agent in the following reaction? 
Now this is an agent, it's not being reduced, it's the reducing agent. What's another word for reducing agent when it comes to these things? Oxidized. Oxidized, my man. Oxidized is means reducing agent, all right? So this question is saying, what is being oxidized? Now, Leo, the lion says, GER, which is what I talked about the other day. Leo stands for lose electrons oxidized. So you want to find a reactant which has lost electrons. And because electrons are negative, that chemical will become more positive. So in this case, it's the nickel, which is the reducing agent. It's been oxidized. The nickel goes to nickel plus two. The only way that can happen is if the nickel has lost two electrons. The silver plus is being reduced. All right, it's gonna gain an electron to make silver metal. Uh, silver plus would be the oxidizing agent. Any questions? Okay, but like I said, the real reason we're doing this is not to make chemicals. Um, another application of this kind of thing, it can happen when you separate the oxidized and reducing places. So again, if we wanted to make copper metal from zinc metal and copper ions, put them together, very efficient. Again, this was the empirical formula that we did, so it's, it's a good lab to make this kind of stuff and that's cool. But notice this comment, no useful electric current, okay? So what we're gonna do next is remembering that electrons are basically moving electrons and that metals can make electrons move through them, they conduct electricity. What you can do is separate the oxidized and reducing species from each other. And if you put a series of wires and things together that can make them transfer, you can actually make electric current go round and round and round. Now, we talked on Friday about galvanic and voltaic cells. And all that means is that when you put this stuff together, the current starts flowing. It's a good battery, <laughs> all right? There's another kind of battery called an electrolytic battery. Those are dead batteries, and believe it or not, there's use in talking about those too. But for right now, we're just gonna talk about the batteries that work. So like on my remote control, I push the button and the little right light comes on, all right? This is in my, in my remote control, I have a galvanic or voltaic cell. If you have an eye clicker, a phone, a calculator, you should also have a galvanic or voltaic cell. Uh, if you want it to work, all right? So this is an example of how an electrolytic cell can be created, all right? And here in this example, we have a piece of copper metal in copper two plus ions. And on the other side, you've got a piece of zinc metal and there's also some zinc two plus ions running around, all right? And look what they did. They took a piece of copper wire, which is essentially this little black line right here, and connected the zinc side to the copper side, all right? And also in the middle right here, they have something called a salt bridge, all right? This is really like a type of a U-tube, not the cool U-tube with cat videos on it. Darn it, but it's literally like a little plastic or glass piece of tubing, all right? And there's usually some kind of thing like agar, which is essentially like a type of seaweed they put into it. All the salt bridge does is it transfers ions. But here's the beauty of this, which is amazing. In this reaction, we saw earlier that zinc goes to zinc two plus and copper two plus goes to copper, all right? So what happens when you separate out the oxidized and reduced spots is that there's a natural tendency for the electrons from zinc to travel this way on the wire. See the current being, that's the sign of the current flowing. So zinc, it makes the zinc two plus ions and the electrons that come from it go this way and they go over to the copper metal, this thing right here. But what the electrons do is they, as they go through the copper, they react with the copper two plus ions in solution. So copper metal starts being formed. Now, 
if you're going to have copper two plus in solution, you can't have just copper two plus by itself. Like you can't take out a, a bottle of copper two plus and sprinkle it in. Copper two plus always comes with a counter anion. And in this example, it's a sulfate. So they started with a solution of copper two sulfate. Well, as the copper two plus makes copper, all of a sudden now you've got a lot of negative ions running around. And those negative ions are like, wow, we don't really like it here. Our friend copper two plus has left. So the salt bridge allows the sulfates to move over to the side with the zinc two plus. Because on this side, as the electrons go up here, all of a sudden now there's a lot of zinc two plus ions running around. You have to keep electrical neutrality to make sure you don't have like an overload of the system. So the sulfates come over here to start reacting, if you will, with the zinc. And if you think about this long enough, sulfate is a source of electrons. It's big and negative, all right? So electrons end up kind of traveling like this, all right? And this part is a little weird, but the sulfates end up with the zinc two plus. So more zinc two plus can go off with the sulfates. And that means more electrons go here. Da, 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 da. Welcome to the world of the battery. If you look on your battery, you will see a positive and a negative. All right. The positive and the negative are just like the positive and the negative here. Electrons come from the site that's being oxidized and they go to the site that's being reduced. Remember, like, electrons are negative. They're attracted to positive things. They want to get away from negative things and go to the positive things. Our batteries are probably a little bit more sophisticated than the zinc copper one we're looking at right here. We'll talk about types of batteries later, but it's the same idea, all right? This is an example of direct current. You have a directionality that the electrons go. You can have a little light bulb or a little switch on there. The light bulb would show that your electrons are transferring. Cool. On the other hand, the switch is what I'm using right now. The switch is off when I'm not pushing the button. When I push the button and my red light comes on, that means the switch is down, the electrons start flowing. So this very simple device, which is started by the Italians long time ago, Galva and, and Volta or whatever their names were, uh, they were the ones that started to figure this out. And it's really, really cool. You can use the electricity to do different kind of things. This is what we use when we have cell phones and calculators, remote controls, et cetera, et cetera. So, Get kind of excited here. Let me break it down. <laughs> Instead of having oxidized and reduced right next to each other, which is really what we've looked at so far, in this kind of battery, in this kind of voltaic or voltaic cell, you can separate the oxidized and reduced, all right? This is the site of oxidation, where electrons are coming from. And electrons want to get away from it as soon as they can. That's why it's got the negative sign. The electrons will go through a wire to the positive side. Electrons are attracted to positive. They find the copper two pluses down here and like score and they make copper metal. But you can't put copper two plus in a vacuum. In this case, it came with a sulfate. Sulfate now all of a sudden doesn't feel wanted because the copper two plus is turning into copper. So the sulfates go through this salt bridge thing, which is basically just ionic highway to get from one side to the other. And they start hanging out with the zinc two pluses that are being made. And as zinc two plus hangs with sulfate, more zinc is giving up electrons to go that way. It's pretty cool. Welcome to the world of the chemical battery. And again, I would argue that almost all of our batteries we use in our electronics would be more chemical. The stuff, the electricity we get from the wall, that comes from hydroelectric plants, solar, windmills, it's that kind of stuff, right? That's totally cool. Those are alternating currents, and that's, that's a neat source of electricity too. But if you want a battery like these guys right here, that's what it's all about. You'll never look at batteries the same. <laughs> get too excited. Questions? So, <clears throat> the one side is where the oxidation occurs. You can know that because in this case, we knew that zinc goes to zinc two plus, copper two plus goes to copper. Anode is the fancy name for the site of oxidation. 
So when you hear the term anode, that's where the oxidation occurs. It's the negative terminal because electrons are coming from the anode and they're gonna go over to the positive terminal. Now the positive terminal is where the copper two plus is becoming copper. That's the site of reduction. Cathode is the fancy name for the site of reduction. And it gets the positive sign then uh, because that's where the electrons wanna go. The anions will go from the cathode to the anode. To make everything balanced, some of the cations go the opposite way. Don't be too worried about that part. I'm more interested that you can see the flow of the electrons and the charges going from one to the other. Now, if anode and cathode are new terms to you, which I, is totally cool, please realize oxidize, oxidation and anode are both vowels, A-E-I-O-U. So A and O go together, the vowels. On the other side, R and C are both consonants, not vowels, all right? And they go together. So that's one way to kind of help remember oxidation is anode, reduction is cathode. The salt bridge just keeps the anions on this side uh, going to the other side so they can start hanging out with the newly created cations, all right? And again, as long as you can kind of keep the electrons going, pretty cool. There's lots of ways to remember reduction in cathode and uh, this poor red kitty. Uh, red cat is another term that's used for reduction at the cathode. And you can have an ox with red cat. Uh, red cat, reduction, cathode, and ox, anode, oxidation. Again, I still like the vowels versus consonants, but not everybody, you know, wow, agrees with me. Imagine that. But anyway, these are all just different ways to help you remember these terms and stuff. Also, I get to show the cute red cat. Uh, and again, oh yeah, always in the background. Oxidation reduction is not only a huge field in terms of industry, but it's also an old field. So again, reduction agent also means oxidation. Reduction means oxidizing agent. So the red cat reduction cathode would be reduction cathode oxidizing agent, while an ox would be the reducing agent. Wow. Okay, sometimes instead of drawing a big diagram for the battery out, they'll use a shorthand notation. And this is the kind of notation that's used a lot. And at first it seems really weird, but it actually makes pretty good sense once you figure it out. So instead of writing copper two plus plus zinc making zinc two plus and copper, this way when you start getting used to it is a way that represents this reaction right here. And you're like, okay, anything you say. Well, the first thing you have to do is that electrons flow from left to right, all right? So just the way that we read is also the way the electrons are flowing. So what that means is that the electrons start with zinc. Zinc ends up as zinc two plus. And the electrons, if you will, jump over this double line to make copper two plus into copper, all right? So electrons are going from left to right, from the oxidation to the reduction. So if oxidation is on the left, that's the anode, oxidation, anode, red, a red cat would be this one right here. On the other hand, this would be then the cathode, the source of reduction. All right, copper two plus is gaining the electrons to make copper. This is the red cat. Um, single lines mean phase boundary. So you're going from like a solid to a solution in this case, or in this case, from a solution to a solid. And the double line represents the salt bridge, the way to separate the anode from the cathode kind of thing. So when you see this and you get used to it, it does kind of make sense. And it's very shorthand, very efficient. You could write it in Microsoft Word or Google Slides and stuff like that um, without having to draw all the different pieces. So. All right, uh, fat cat. <laughs> there's all kind. Of, this is there's all kinds of acronyms in this. Uh, electrons flow from the anode to the cathode. Again, these are just things. Sometimes people like them, sometimes they don't. But it's kind of fun to show pictures of cats. I'm a cat person. No offense to dogs by any means, man. But uh, anyway, cats. Cats are fun. Oh yeah, I don't think dogs are cool too. Don't worry, I just don't have cool dog expressions to use. So. 
Okay, let's talk about what this half cell then would mean. Okay, so remembering that electrons flow from the left to the right, all right, we can kind of begin to make sense of how this works out. So electrons are flowing from the left to the right. That means the electrons are going from the copper to the copper two plus. So this is oxidation. And oxidation and anode go together. They're both uh, vowels or and ox, whatever you want to use. Um, <clears throat> 1.0 molarity just means the concentration of the ion that you're looking at. You don't need it for solids, liquids, and gases, but you do need it for solutions. Um, so this is the salt bridge. Electrons are coming from copper to copper 2 plus, and they're going over here. So that means the chlorine here is taking those electrons to make chloride, all right? It doesn't usually have the 2 right there. You can put it in, but that's not the standard. So chlorine is becoming chloride. And the reason that the platinum is right there is that a gas and a solution aren't very good about getting the electrons to the chlorine. So you need some kind of neutral metal that can conduct the electrons through there. Um, copper can work, uh, but platinum is even better. Platinum, nickel, palladium are really good uh, anodes and stuff like that. So this extra piece on the end here just says that they've got a platinum wire that they're sticking into the chlorine gas at one atmosphere of pressure, so the chlorine gas can become chloride ions. So this would be the site then of the reduction. Electrons are being taken in by the chlorine. This is the site of the oxidation. Any questions on that? I'm just wondering, like, why is it PCl2 and not PT? Because what does the P mean? It's half of the task. Well, uh, what, um, tell me what your PCl2, this one right here? Yeah. And then it's supposed to be platinum. <clears throat> Cool, excellent question. Um, this P stands for pressure, all right? Um, Stephanie, when, yeah, absolutely, I totally agree, absolutely. No, that, I'm glad you asked, because that's one of those things you'll be thinking about all day and going, what the heck, Russell? Yeah, um, pressures of gases are usually expressed in atmospheres, millimeters, mercury, stuff like that. So it's trying to tell you that the pressure of the chlorine gas is one atmosphere. Good question. We're talking about things in standard states right now, which is usually one mole per liter, one atmosphere. If we had a temperature, it would be 25 Celsius. We'll talk about later what to do when you're not at one mole per liter and one atmosphere of pressure, so, or temperature. Okay. In a voltaic electrochemical cell, an oxidation occurs at an electrode called the anode. The electrons released at the anode travel through a wire to another electrode called the cathode, where the electrons are consumed in a reduction reaction. Anions are then shuttled through a salt bridge from the cathode compartment to the anode compartment. Otherwise, a net negative charge would build up in the cathode compartment. The negative charges move in a circuit through the cell. You can probably see after discussing all this that after a while your batteries will die on you because you'll run out of sources of electrons, all right, something at the anode, or this thing will no longer have anything else to turn into solids. So hopefully you're beginning to see, think about stuff like that, like why does a battery die? Also, we're going to talk here in a little bit about this. This is a voltage, all right? We'll talk about what that means for chemists here in a little bit, but just realize there's a way to talk about how uh, efficient, if you will, batteries can be. Okay, so here's just another example because I want to make sure everybody's clear on this. It says which species is oxidized? So again, species that are oxidized are losing electrons. Now electrons move in these shorthand diagrams from the left to the right. So the electrons would start then in this case at the zinc. They would turn into zinc 2 plus Zinc is the species being oxidized. Cool. Okay, so <clears throat> back to this side. Here's the zinc uh, copper thing and stuff like that. The zinc in this case is on the left, which is fine. You can see the anodes and are flipped back and forth as well as cathodes. But anyway, zinc here is making the electrons, if you will. The electrons are going from the zinc side to the copper side. Copper 2 plus is turning into copper. The counter ion goes this way, all that kind of stuff, all right? 
Um, electrons are going to flow from the negative side to the positive side once again because electrons are negative. They want to get away. So they will uh, go from the anode to the cathode. Now, if you ever do a lot with electrolytic cells, um, which are the batteries that initially are dead, we'll talk about why they're helpful. The signs are flipped, <laughs> all right? Um, I'm not gonna make a big deal of that for you in Chem 223, but I wanna point that out. So if you ever start working in electrochemistry, you'd be like, oh, Russell, you didn't say anything, but so now I have. Good, don't worry about it from here on in. Now, a waterfall, all right, have you ever seen a waterfall, the water go, instead of from the top to the bottom, have you ever seen it go from the bottom to the top? No, hopefully that's, that's a no, all right? And I love science fiction, but I, uh, I have never seen something like that happen. So when you think about a waterfall, all right, you always think about water going from the top to the bottom, and yeah, gravity, blah, blah, blah. So there's a natural propensity for the water to go from a higher elevation to a lower elevation. And you can argue it's gravity and all that stuff, and you're absolutely right. You can think about it like the top has a higher potential energy, and the, lower, and the bottom is a lower potential energy. And in Mother Nature's science, we almost always go from the higher to the lower potential energy. Well, electrons are kind of the same way, all right? Like earlier, we saw how zinc became zinc 2 plus and copper 2 plus became copper. But why did the copper go to copper 2 plus and the zinc 2 plus go to zinc? Um, talking about it that way would be in this world, like the water going from the bottom to the top. There's a natural order on how these things work out, all right? And to talk about the way that electrons flow naturally, we use this idea of what's called electromotive force. An electromotive force, or EMF, all right, is just a way that scientists try to understand why some reactions go this way, but not this way, all right? Why the water goes downhill and not uphill. So this is another way that scientists have been able to measure chemical reactions and see the natural way that things kind of go. Uh, Here's a reaction, here's the zinc and the copper two plus. Now, the concentrations, this is important, exactly one mole per liter, all right? And when you connect the pieces together, all right, uh, you get a type of a voltage, all right? And the voltage, the cell potential, is this number on a voltmeter, which is 1.1 volts, 1.10 volts. So you disconnect the little, this is like a piece of copper metal, by the way. This is a little switch in the middle to measure it. And when you connect them, it should say 1.1. 1 .1. I don't know why the extra zero is there. Sorry about that. But anyway, 1.1 volts is what people read, all right? And that shows the scientists, and it will you too after a while, that the zinc electrons are going to the copper 2 plus, making copper, stuff like that. So we need to figure out uh, the electromotive force that makes this all possible. Like why again is zinc making zinc two plus and zinc two plus isn't being made into zinc, all right? And the same thing over here, copper two plus naturally goes to copper. Why isn't it the copper going to copper two plus? And so if we can understand this EMF thing, we can kind of figure out here what's going on. You're unbelievable. Okay, some of you, I see some smiles, so some of you, I'm not totally dating myself. This band is called EMF, so. Anyway, sorry, couldn't resist. Cheesy music, once again, uh, inhabits my life. But anyway, EMF was a band that was popular for a while. All right, good, enough said. So anyway, when you connect this zinc copper cell together, all right, the voltage that's read is 1.10 volts. And that is going to tell us, as scientists, as we'll talk about in a little bit, uh, which direction the reaction is going to go. Now, notice a lot of this information, 25 degrees Celsius and all the ions are one mole per liter. That's going to be important. We'll talk about how to deal with non-25 Celsius, non-1.0 moles per liter solutions later. But for right now, just realize that's what it is. So what scientists need is like a measuring stick, all right, to tell why zinc goes to zinc 2 plus and copper 2 plus goes to copper naturally in this case. Um, volts are kind of interesting. Volt 
is a joule per coulomb, all right? Now, we've done a lot with joules. That's all the energy kind of things we've done, all right? Heats and all, delta Gs and all that kind of jazz. Coulombs are the ways to measure charge, all right? A coulomb is uh, used to describe, like, uh, how much charge an electron has or a proton or something like that. So volt is what they call a derived SI unit. It comes from a joule and a coulomb. Uh, so if you're curious about that, uh, that's kind of cool. Physicists do a lot more with volts than we will do, but we'll talk about it here a little bit, and I'll try and incorporate things. Okay. So when those uh, values are one mole per liter for the solutions and 25 degrees Celsius, scientists call this a standard cell potential. And it gets the symbol E. E is the symbol for voltage or potential. And E, it's a little zero right there, where the zero just means standard conditions. So if you are at 25 degrees Celsius and your solutions are one mole per liter, or as Stephanie asked about earlier, if you have a gas and it's at one atmosphere, these kind of things, then you're gonna have standard cell potentials. And what we're gonna go into next here is how scientists measure the cell potentials. Uh, we're gonna have a ruler stick to measure cell potentials, kind of cool. And there's a lot of neat things you can do with it. Positive cell potentials are the ones that usually occur. So if you get a positive E, those are the galvanic voltaic cells. Those are the batteries that work, all right? If you put your stuff together and you get a negative E, those are the ones that don't occur by themselves. You've got to do some other stuff we'll talk about briefly, so. Okay, so how do you measure uh, like the cell, the voltmeter said this was the 1.10 volts, but how the heck did they get to that? And that's a really good question. So if we knew the cell potentials of the half reactions, we could add them together to get that overall 1.10 volt value. So what chemists figured out here is that we need a way to measure half reactions, i.e. reactions with the electrons. Now, when it comes to length, everybody collectively decided that the meter, in metric anyway, is going to be a, a unit of length, all right? And you can measure, you know, yourself, your car length, whatever, once you know what a meter is, okay? Well, in these kind of reactions, uh, we need a type of a meter stick as well. We need a, med, a med, blah, we need a meter stick for cell potentials. So scientists just all together got together, and I guess it was quite an issue, but anyway, and they came up with the idea of what's called the standard hydrogen cell electrode. So S-H-C-E, sometimes it's abbreviated just SHE, all right? SHE stands for the standard hydrogen electrode. And why that's important is that this reaction, either direction, is considered to be exactly zero volts. Now, what we have is we have acid at one mole per liter making hydrogen gas at one atmosphere of pressure, all right? And regardless if the acid is making the gas or the gas is making the acid, it's exactly zero volts. So the way that it's shown right now, it's a reduction, all right? The H plus is gaining electrons to make H2. However, if you flip it around, you would have H2 as a reactive, making H plus and electrons as products. That would be an oxidation. But this is the measuring stick, like the meter stick, all right, that we use for measurements. This is the me measuring stick, if you will, for electrochemistry. Uh, it's a little bit weird. Um, you've got some pretty strong acid, which is kind of funky. And of course, anytime you have gases, it's also a little weird because you could have leaks and stuff. But just realize that this is the collective decision that scientists came up with to how to measure these crazy electrovolt values. Okay, so I'm sure you're dying to know how to measure this kind of thing. Good question. What people have done is they've hooked up different half reactions, zinc to zinc two plus, all right? 
and they did the same thing, but they hooked it up this time to the Xi electrode, all right? So this is the Xi electrode. It's got H plus in the solution and hydrogen in uh, being bubbled in, all right? And what they find, all right, is that zinc is going to zinc two plus. So the zinc metal was slowly going away. You'd see the metal or measure the metal being slowly limited. On the other hand, this side, you started to see more and more gas appearing. You need to get the pressure being higher. So in this reaction, the zinc naturally goes to zinc two plus oxidized, so this is the anode. On the other hand, the Xi, all right, we saw more gas and the acid concentration went down, so this one is the cathode. And they plugged it up to the, um, to the voltmeter and they found that the overall volts were 0.76 volts. So real fast what they did, we don't know the zinc going to zinc two plus, but we know that Xi is zero volts. And this plus this equals the voltmeter value of 0.76. So big surprise probably, you take the 0.76 and subtract C, that comes out to be positive 0.76. That's the cell potential of this reaction. So this is how scientists got this. Zinc getting oxidized to zinc two plus, naturally 0.76 volts. All right, we will do more of this on Wednesday. Um, we're seeing here how these uh, electro values come around. That's what we're going for. Any questions? Have a great day. Thanks for being here.